Not bad. Appreciate yeah. you having us on. Uh, thank you. We are joined by Jesse Merrick of News 3. And we also have John Ramio, the play-by-play of Wolfpack Radio. Welcome to Las Vegas. You're going to be at Allegiant Stadium for the first time ever. Um, are you excited about that? Very, very excited. Uh, you know, it's the newest and biggest and brightest situation uh, in the NFL. And uh, I grew up in the East Bay area, so I, uh, I've always kept an eye on the Raiders and uh, certainly uh, looking forward to uh, seeing their new home. Um, it's going to be weird with uh, the very limited capacity, but I understand, you know, that's how it has to be. And certainly I think the emotions of the game will, uh, will supersede any excitement about the venue, but I think there will be a, a time uh, before kickoff when everybody's kind of wide-eyed and just looking around. That includes me, Jesse Merrick. <laughs> He's been there a few times already. This is my first live game since March 12th, since the uh, pandemic uh, for the Pac-12 tournament. But uh, Jesse, give uh, John a little preview of the Allegiant Stadium once he goes upstairs to the booth in the press box. Man, I mean, you're going to be blown away when you get up in there, John. It is it is unbelievable. It is like you said, it's eerie without any fans in there. Obviously, there's going to be some fans. So it's going to be a little, a little bit better than it was the, uh, the Raiders throughout the year. But, man, that place, once it is packed, it's going to be almost kind of like a college feel where the players were insane for the Raiders that it feels like the fans will be right up on top of you. So it's it's fun. It's beautiful. The Ladai doors, I hope they open them up for this game. I, I haven't seen them open them up yet, but the view to the trip, is unreal. I mean, you're gonna have a blast walking around there, and it's so it's so Vegas too in the sense of the things that they have throughout the stadium of just ties to, to Vegas and Nevada as a whole. And then again, it's just a beautiful stadium. I mean, two billion dollars well spent. It's you're, you're really gonna like what you see, that's for sure. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I had fun times at uh, Sam Boyd Stadium, but to be at Allegiant Stadium for this one, it's for me, since the pandemic, again, like I said, it's, it's going to be exciting. And uh, just want to give a quick shout out to uh, T.C. Martin for introducing me to John Ramey and also to the Westgate Superbook for allowing us to host here yet again. And uh, just to open it up, uh, John, the Wolfpack, they are favored by seven. Obviously, UNLV plus seven dogs. Um, what do you think about those odds so far provided by uh, the Superbook? That's interesting. I had seen 14, which seemed huge to me, but seven seems much more reasonable uh, given, you know, it's a uh, it's a rivalry game. You know, you can't assume too much. Uh, also, it's just the second game of a year of a, of a shortened season, right? It's the second of eight scheduled games. So I think it, there's, a, there's a, a limiting, a squashing, a compression effect. Uh, due to the long off season, the stops and the starts in the season. Um, and then also just, yeah, the rivalry game is a great leveler. I think five out of the last seven games have gone to the underdog. I think six out of the last eight um, have gone to the road team. Shout out to Chris Murray from Nevada sports net for that uh, little nugget. So yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I uh, just for research purposes only, we'll look at the uh, point spread and the money line. Um, but I just think, you know, in rivalry games, it's uh, it's always a, a, a bit dangerous to feel too certain about anything other than the unexpected. And Jesse, far as uh, your scouting report goes for the Nevada Wolfpack, based on last week's game and what you've seen so far out of UNLV during practices, uh, what do you think about uh, this plus being seven for UNLV? Yeah, I mean, uh, like John had said, I saw 14 as well and was like, whoa, man, like that kind of blew the doors off right there when I saw that. But, again, I think it's a little more reasonable, especially the way that Nevada came out against Wyoming. I mean, the way they were throwing the ball, that was that was fun to watch. I got to admit that. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that matchup. But, yeah, as a whole, man, I, like you said, you, you never know what to expect in a rivalry game. Both coaches, I've heard them both mention the same thing, that, you know, anything can happen. And it's cliche. But it's true because it's a rivalry game. It's 2020 football during COVID. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. Obviously, Arroyo still has some of the newness on his side as well. Of Maybe, uh, you know, Nevada not necessarily knowing what to expect because obviously we saw what they did against San Diego State. Didn't really put a whole lot of good stuff on tape. There. So, you know, we don't know what a good UNLV team looks like when they're rolling. So it's going to be really interesting to see maybe how, to, how these two teams match up and if UNLV can get things going. Uh, you know, how long it may take Nevada to kind of figure out, okay, this is what they're doing. Now we make our adjustments to it as well. Yeah, and one big thing that really stands out to me right now, who's in, who's out for UNLV? Um, obviously, there's still concerns about Randall Grimes, 
uh, Makai Stevenson, Brandon Presley. Um, do you expect any of these players to be ready for this game come Saturday? I mean, I, I personally don't have any inside info on that, but I, if, if they're not listed on there, I don't think they're going to be back for it, which obviously is a big loss. I mean, Grimes in general, I mean, that guy is a kid transferred from SC. You know, we're expecting big things from him. Stevenson, another really good receiver from last year as well. So those are some things that are missing in this offense. But at the end of the day, this team needs to uh, kind of, you know, win this game on the ground. So they still do have Chuck Williams. The Chuck Wagon is still playing. So that's obviously big for them to have him. And then from there, kind of just see who ends up taking this quarterback job and if they can spread it around to, to the many different targets that they do have that are in the game. But, again, like I said, I don't expect those – receivers to be back in this one which obviously is a big loss for the rebels but that's 2024 you never know what to expect with that type of stuff exactly and uh same question for you john uh is there anybody we can expect to be in or out for the nevada wolfpack uh last week uh toa tawa did not play he was uh, thought to be the starting running back in his place a freshman named avery morrow was very impressive freshman out of seattle washington and Garfield High School ran for a touchdown, had some great straight-ahead speed. Uh, Devontae Lee is a junior and more of a bruising running back. So between Morrow and Lee, they seem to have uh, filled out the, the gap left by uh, Tawa's absence. Um, uh, receiver Elijah Cooks, who was uh, the Pack's leading receiver a season ago and an all-conference player, was injured in the second half against Wyoming, so I don't expect to see him. Um, but the Wolfpack is very deep. At the receiver position, Romeo Dubs had the game-winning catch in overtime. He had a career-high 12 receptions last week. He's an all-conference talent, and uh, he'll probably be the featured guy on the outside with regard to the passing game. So those are kind of the two big guys in the offense uh, that I would expect not to see. I'm most curious about the, the UNLV quarterback situation because they played three different guys in the first half. And uh, Coach Arroyo even said in his press conference, look, we're all trying to see what's going on. He I believe he said nobody – took it outright. And so I think that's going to be a challenge really both for the Rebel offense and the Pack defense to kind of figure out what's going on. But yeah, Williams is the guy. I mean, he he ran all over Nevada last year, 138 yards and had an 80-yard run and was really a problem uh, at Mackey Stadium a season ago. And actually, you alluded to a, my next question and uh, that I'll go to you, Jesse. Who do you think on the UNLV secondary can slow down that talented wide receiver corpse for Nevada? Man, I, to be, I'll, I'll just be simple in the answer. I don't know, to be completely honest, because I, I've heard that you guys have some big-time size out there. Again, I saw it a little bit against Wyoming. And so I'm really interested to kind of watch that battle. Overall, it's a young secondary uh, for UNLV, really just a young team in general in a lot of different spots. But uh, that secondary, where they're going to kind of have to grow up quickly against this team that loves to chuck the ball. Against San Diego State, that's not really their bread and butter. They were running the ball. So this is going to be their first test really facing a, an aerial attack. And, again, I mean, we saw that you guys against Wyoming didn't really run the ball much because they didn't have to. You were just chucking it. I mean, I just even looked, too, 79 plays that you guys ran in that game. That is a high-powered offense. And, obviously, I know it went to OT and all that stuff, but that is still a lot of plays for even an OT game. So I'm just interested to see how they hold up and also their conditioning as well in a, in a game like this where, obviously, Nevada is going to kind of want to push the pace and run a ton of plays. So – to answer your question, I don't know because there's still so much unknown about this team. So we don't even really know much about how those guys are going to play because they haven't even been tested yet. Right on, right on. So, John, let's go down to the trenches where the big guys play, the meat, bones of this team. Uh, who's a standout uh, offensive lineman for you that they would have to watch out in that front seven versus UNLV? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Tyler Orsini. Uh, had a standout game as the center for Nevada. He's a senior. He's got a lot of experience. Jacob Gardner started at left tackle. First true freshman to start at left tackle for Nevada since they joined the ranks of uh, the FBS division, which goes back to 1992. So Gardner on the left side is a true freshman, but held his own against Wyoming. And, you know, the Cowboys are known for their culture of a good pass rush. They had the second most sacks in the Mountain West a season ago. Nevada gave up three. But all things considered, with a, a freshman on the left tackle spot and Wyoming on the other side, it, it was a very improved performance by the offensive line, which quite candidly was a weakness last year on a Wolfpack team that went and lost a bowl game, went two and lost a bowl game. Uh, so, yeah, Orsini up front and Gardner on the left side would be the two guys that are kind of key. You also have Nate Brown uh, on the right side, who who is a real veteran, uh, the most experienced on the offensive line. 
Uh, that's great. You got some bookend tackles to, to help out that quarterback. For the casual fans, can you just talk more about uh, the quarterback and what for for the Wolfpack, what he will mm-hmm. bring to this team come tomorrow night? So, so it's Carson Strong, and he's a redshirt sophomore, but he was uh, an early admit into school, and so he had three spring balls with uh, with the pack. He played one snap in 2018, and then because of the redshirt rule, which has evolved to allow guys to get a little action, then he had his redshirt season in 2018. Last year, as a redshirt freshman, uh, led the brilliant comeback in the opener against Purdue, then got banged up against Marcus Arroyo's Oregon Ducks team. Remember, Arroyo was the OC on a Ducks team that hung uh, 77 on the back last year. And in that game, Strong got hurt, but nobody really talked about it, but he had a bruised sternum, and he was just not right until the back end of the season. And he closed like a house of fire in the loss to UNLV. He threw for a career high 33 completions. He threw for over 350 yards in the bowl game. He set a career high with 402 yards passing. And then he threw for 420 in the opener this year. So he started really, or rather he finished really strong a season ago. And he has started very strong this year. And he has the best streak in the nation at 203 pass attempts without an interception. He's big. He's got a strong arm. He's not super mobile, but he's kind of a prototypical pocket passer. 6'4", big arm guy. And uh, he's a team captain, even though he's a sophomore. He, he really has the locker room. Uh, that, that, great point. So now we'll go back to you, Jesse. Um, who do you expect to start, Max Gilliman or Kenyon O'Bad or Justin Rogers for UNLV come tomorrow night? Yeah, I mean, as of right now, Gillian was listed number one on the depth chart for this week, so we expect him to be the guy. But, again, I wouldn't be shocked to see Royal continue to rotate through because, again, he did say nobody took the job. Uh, so that's kind of going to be something we're going to have to watch throughout. And kind of like John said, you know, that's something that the Nevada defense does have to prepare for a bit because each guy – Brings a little something different to the table. Um, but I do expect that he'll give Gilliam a little bit more time. Uh, you know, I think he had two series, two, maybe three series before he pulled him out and then kind of started with the rotation there. So I'd imagine maybe he gets at least a quarter to kind of get something going unless something catastrophic happens and it's just like the wheels are falling off and you got to start doing something and mix it up. But I'd imagine that Gilliam will be the guy for at least a quarter, kind of see how he plays, maybe see if he can take that job in the first quarter impress a royal a little bit and give him reason to keep him in there the rest of the game. I would like to just say Wolfpack fans don't want to see Kenyon Oblad because he was 16 <laughs> of 22 and you know kept kept uh, the Rebels out in front and then won it in overtime a season ago. So I, I know that's not necessarily the most indicative sample size of his overall performance. Obviously, if it were, there wouldn't be a three-way competition for the position. But Kenyon Oblad really uh, took down the pack last year in a very impressive performance. Yeah, I'm Absolutely. with you there, John. And sling it. I, I I hope he gets that opportunity to kind of show what he can do. Uh, just because again, he's got the local tie in here to Vegas, but that yep. kid has a lot of arm. That's for sure. You think? Hey, I know it's Marcus Royal's first uh, rivalry game with UNLV, but you think he'll get a little chippy down there? You know, at Allegiant Stadium. What do you think is going to happen over there, John? I mean, it, we hope it's not as chippy as it was at the end last year. But I think you know this is. I mean, I have had the privilege of covering USC UCLA before I got the uh, the Nevada job. I was part of the broadcast team at UCLA, and growing up, uh, my dad was the broadcaster for Stanford, and so I got to see Stanford Cal, which is another great rivalry. Um, all three are great college football, you know, grudges, but this one's the chippiest. I mean, this is this is the one that's like the most cantankerous, and so fans, no fans, Arroyo's first time doesn't matter. Like it's the cannon game. This will be my fourth time uh, calling the battle for the Fremont cannon. It's Jay Norvell's fourth cannon game. I mean, it means the world to both fan bases and the players can tell. Oh yeah, absolutely. So my question is this, what are the keys to victories for the Nevada Wolfpack to walk away and bring back the cannon to Reno? I would say they need to play uh, – Carson Strong needs to not turn over the football, which he has been very adept at avoiding those uh, at the end of last year and the start of this year. And they really just need to keep Williams from going crazy. Uh, I think other than that, Nevada has more experience and their systems are more entrenched, uh, especially on the offensive side. Um, you know, Arroyo's in year one of building a program. There are a lot of freshmen. There's a lot of turnover. It's just his second game. Uh, so, so I think, you know – the the numbers are 
why they are for a reason. Uh, I think if Nevada can just avoid a, a breakout performance from Williams or Oblad or somebody like that, 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 that they have, would have a pretty good shot at winning. And I'll bring it back to you, Jesse. What are the key victories for UNLV to bring to keep the Cannon here in Las Vegas? Yeah, my job was down in terms of, you know, they need to contain Chuck on the other end. Obviously, UNLV needs to get him going. That was one thing with the team. I believe he only had five carries in the first half uh, against standing. So Arroyo needs to feed him early and often in order to keep that Nevada offense on the sideline. I mean, that's the only way I think they're going to really have a shot this one. If they keep the rest of that offense from Nevada on the sideline, they come sit there and really just control the knee. Chuck just power it all down the field. Because, again, they've got an experienced offensive line and one of the few areas where they actually have experience. Um, so that's one of their biggest strengths. And, again, in the secondary, you gotta you got to stop those receivers, man. If you can figure out a way to contain that passing attack, um, you know, I think UNLV is pretty confident that they can win this game if they can slow them down on that front and then actually run the football. So it's going to – for UNLV, I think their game plan is going to be one of those ones that maybe not be sexy to watch, but just control the ball ground game, short, quick passes, and hopefully that also helped to get uh, Gilliam going as well. That's an easy way to kind of build some confidence in him and just methodically march down the field. So that's really what they got to do. Right on. So here we go. Got one for you. It's one thing I left out. These two teams are playing on Nevada Day. That's pretty huge for the state of Nevada. So, John, I want your prediction with the score. Who do you like? And why? Oh, man. Predictions. Uh, I just do observations. No predictions. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> let's say let's say uh, Nevada 35-24. I like that. Jesse? Yeah, I'm actually, man, people in Vegas are going to hate me for this one. <laughs> this is why I hate you. <laughs> but I got to keep it real, man. I think it's going to be uh, probably 31-21. Uh, Nevada, I think, at the least. I think that offense is going to be too much for UNLV to slow down. So the Cannons going back to Reno tomorrow. Don't, got don't at me. Don't at me, baby. Hey, <laughs> let, let, and, and let me just say this. I work for the Wolfpack, but I got nothing but love for Las Vegas. I, I love yeah. coming here. Yeah. That, I, I respect that. So, guys, thank you once again for your time. John, where can we find you at on social media? Uh, at Wolf underscore Pack underscore Radio on the Twitter. Jesse? Nice. I'm at Jesse News 3 on Twitter. Hit me up. Thank you, guys. Tune in next week. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, man. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, guys. All right. Let me.